Our Father in heaven, Lord, we do love you, Lord. Always tonight, Lord God, it, it's always good to be in your house, Lord God, whether it be a Sunday morning or Wednesday or Saturday morning, whatever it is, Lord God, it, it always feels good to be here with your people. Uh, Lord, this is your house. It's, it's not my house. It's not our house. It's your house, Lord. And we just, Lord, thank you so much for your goodness, for your grace. Despite whatever our busy lives might look like, despite whatever struggles we might be facing or circumstances that might be surrounding us, Lord God, we, we thank you that you got us here tonight. I pray that you would fill us with your love and your peace and extend your grace to us, Lord God, that we would, again, just trust in you, continually reading your word and understanding your truth that would build faith in our lives to know, Lord God, that you are God, that there's no one like you, and that you have a plan and a purpose for everything you allow, Lord. Teach us that tonight, Lord, as we look to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good evening once again. If you have a Bible, which I hope you do, let's turn to Daniel chapter 9. Okay? Daniel chapter 9. As I mentioned, again, we will be uh, wrapping up again the chapter and just covering eight verses. And so it's, it's uh, the last eight verses of Daniel chapter 9, but we're going to have to take it slow as we go through these eight verses because they cover some pretty incredible, incredible Bible prophecy again, uh, as, as we'll see in just a few minutes. Now, as I always do, again, just by way of introduction, remember... Um, what the book of Daniel is about. It's 12 chapters. The first six chapters were historical as we covered the life of Daniel. But then the second six chapters are all primarily prophetical. They all deal with prophecy, the future. Now there were two types of prophecy that Daniel was given. Daniel was given near prophecy which pertained to the next several decades and centuries after Daniel's life. But then there's even farther or future prophecy such as what we read in the book of Revelation that still has not happened yet. Daniel was given both types. Now the reason Daniel was given prophecy, in case you're wondering, is way back, let me just take you back briefly, way back in chapter 2 you might remember that God had gifted Daniel with the ability to interpret dreams. And in chapter 2, we read that King Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest king of the Babylonians, had a recurring dream. And in this dream, again, he was fearful. He saw himself standing before this massive statue, and he couldn't understand what it was. And he called all the wise men in his kingdom to interpret the dream, none of whom could do it. When finally... Daniel was summoned. God had prepared. God had already gifted Daniel with the ability to interpret dreams. Daniel interprets the dream for King Nebuchadnezzar. Again, this was in Daniel chapter 2. And he explained to Nebuchadnezzar that what he saw was himself. He was the golden head. And then he saw three more future kingdoms, world kingdoms, that were to come after Babylon was gone. All of these future kingdoms would rule the world, and primarily they would rule over the people of Israel and the land of Israel and the promised land. Now, Daniel interpreted this dream, and as Daniel was interpreting it for him, you have to wonder what Daniel was thinking. Every Jew who knows their Bible, knows that God made a promise to King David, and I love that we keep covering this over and over again. God promised to King David that one day one of his descendants would come, the Messiah, and he would reestablish the kingdom of Israel upon the earth. That was a promise God made. And so you have to put yourself in Daniel's shoes. He is told, as he interprets this dream for Nebuchadnezzar, that there were going to be three moral world kingdoms that were to come that were going to rule over the land of Israel and the Jews. And so Daniel had to be thinking, what about the kingdom of Israel? We're going to continue to be slaves? When is the Messiah going to come in fulfillment of 2 Samuel chapter 7 and establish the kingdom of Israel once again? In his mind, it didn't fit together. How could these three kingdoms come, but at the same time, God still keep his promise that the kingdom of Israel would be established? And so, again, from chapter 7 through chapters 12, the Lord begins to reveal the future to Daniel, to explain to Daniel, and thank God to us, right, how all of these things are going to work out, how all of these things can fit together. 
And that's what, again, all of these prophecies are all about. In case you haven't been with us, Daniel 7, chapter 7, was the complete panorama of the future, beginning from King Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom of the Babylonians, going all the way until Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom on earth. Then in chapter 8, it's narrowed in its focus, and the prophecy is about two world kingdoms, the medo persian Empire and the Greco-Macedonian Empire. These were two of the next empires that were to come, again, after Babylon had fallen. And Daniel seen in this vision, this was in chapter 8, that the Jews would continue to be persecuted. And as we look at Jewish history, hasn't that been their history? Yes, right? Persecution. And so Daniel, again, you have to imagine his heart, his heart for his people. He saw the future. God showed him the future, and he only seen more suffering for his people. And so what happened? In chapter 9, we found Daniel, at the beginning of the chapter, this was last week, reading the book of Jeremiah. You guys might remember, he's reading from the scrolls of the prophet Jeremiah. And as he's reading from the scrolls, he comes across Jeremiah's prediction. We covered this in detail last week, but let me summarize it for you. In Jeremiah 25, 11, and 12... Daniel read the prophecy that the king and kingdom of Babylon would fall after reigning for 70 years. Now that was important. Why? Because Daniel chapter 9 began with the kingdom of Babylon having just fallen. In other words, that prophecy had just come to pass. Wow. It was right on time when God showed and literally reminded Daniel of what Jeremiah had written just decades earlier. But Daniel kept reading. We know this because in Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14, Daniel came across another prophecy, another prediction that when the 70 years of captivity were completed, the Lord would bring the Jews back home. And again, that's what they would have wanted. That's what every Jew would have wanted. So what happened? Last week, we covered the prayer of Daniel for his people. Because after reading about What was to happen? Daniel began to pray. And we read such, if you were with us again, such a beautiful model of prayer is what we read last week. Daniel again prayed, looking to the Jews being freed from captivity, being able to return back home to Judah and Jerusalem, being able to rebuild the sanctuary where once more they could worship God, their God, the one true God. And that's what Daniel 9, 1 through 19 was all about, okay? That's what last week, in a nutshell, was all about. But remember, Daniel had more concern. How was this going to work out? How were we going to be able to return back home after the 70 years? But what about the next empires that were to come? And what about the Messiah? When is he going to come and reestablish his kingdom on earth? This would have been the concern. This would have been what would have been in the heart of Daniel, wondering, God, when are you going to bring these things to pass? And the beautiful thing we see as we now pick up in verse 20 of chapter 9, is God revealing his plans for Israel, okay? God revealing his plans for Israel. We're taking notes again. This is what we're going to cover as we wrap up the chapter again, the last eight verses of chapter 9, as God reveals the specific plans he has for the nation of Israel. Now, I want to say something really quick, and then we're going to pick up where we left off. As important as the next verses are, and they are important, and I hope you take notes tonight, I want you to understand that these verses do not pertain to us. Does that make sense? They do not pertain to us. They pertain specifically to the Jewish nation. Does that make sense? I want to make this clear, okay? Oftentimes, there are things in the Bible that apply to all God's people, right? Jew and Gentile, right? Believers on both sides. This is not one of them. 
This passage we need to understand because we need to understand what's going to take place with the nation of Israel, but we need to understand this does not apply to the church. And I want to make that crystal clear again before we pick up. And so if you're taking notes, again, we're looking at God's plan for Israel. We are going to see God's answer to Daniel regarding Israel, regarding what's going to happen to his people and to their land, the promised land. And the first thing we read is the message of Gabriel, okay? The message of Gabriel. Let's pick it up here again. Verse 20, chapter 9, Daniel writes, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God. While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. Okay? At the time of the evening sacrifice. Now, Daniel explains to us that the prayer that he just uttered, verses 1 through 19, took place during the time of the evening sacrifice, okay? During, time, during the time when the evening sacrifices would have taken place. Now, that's interesting. That should be interesting. Why? Because you have to remember that the temple has been destroyed. You guys remember that? The temple had been destroyed in 586 B.C. by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire, the Babylonian army. It was destroyed, and all the captives were hauled back to Babylon. There was no temple. If there was no temple, guess what? There was no sacrifices. This is important. But Daniel's saying he is praying at the time of the evening sacrifices. Now get this. According to Exodus 19, 38 and 39, the law of Moses required two sacrifices, right? One in the morning and one at night. These were daily sacrifices that were to take place. The temple has now been destroyed for 66 years, right? We're at the end of the 70 years now. And yet, Daniel still prayed during the time that the evening sacrifices would have taken place. Does that make sense? No, I love this. This is very, very interesting. And this is beautiful. This tells us that even though there was no, no longer a temple, even though Daniel was no longer in Jerusalem, right? He's in Babylon. He still observed the proper time of worship. I love that, right? He still observed the proper time of worship. Now, I love this because this is an incredible lesson, and I want to touch on this because you need to get this. Daniel, even though he was hauled away as a teenager, right, from Jerusalem, he was a man of God, even though he was a young man of God, who observed the law of Moses, who again offered the proper sacrifices, who did what was required, right, of every man and woman of God. And so even though Daniel was no longer in Jerusalem and the temple was no longer there, he still prayed. You guys might remember from chapter 6, he prayed three times a day. You guys remember that? That was his pattern. That was the routine he did. And I love it because he's not at church, right? The temple's gone. He's not in Jerusalem. Now, I've shared this so many times before, and, and I really encourage you. When I look back at my life, I'm coming up on 30 years now serving the Lord, right? 30 years. And I look back, and I see so many people that have fallen, so many believers that I thought would always be right here or there, serving together and are no longer here. I know it's all by the grace and the mercy of God, without a doubt. But I also believe that the Bible says that we are to work out our own what? salvation. We are to, in other words, God will do his part, amen? But we need to do ours. And one of the most important things, I will tell a baby Christian or a mature Christian, it makes no difference, that one of the smartest things you need to do is establish godly routines. Does that make sense? Establish godly routines. Build good habits, okay? Every day you're praying, Every day you're reading your word, okay? 
I'm not saying you have to pray for three hours. If you got five minutes, guess what? Pray for five minutes, right? If you've got 15 minutes to read, then read for 15 minutes. But be in your word every day. Be praying every day. How about this? Come to church when the doors are open. What a novel concept, huh? It's so simple. Seriously. It is so simple. But the awesome thing is when we build these routines, guess what? We build habits. And these are good, strong, healthy habits that help keep us on track. Someone say amen. Okay, because that is so, so important. Now, I love this. Let me give you an example. I am so used to, I'm just talking to my personal life. I am so used to praying for you guys and praying for the church and praying for the church services, right? I do it at 830. I do it at 1030 on Sunday, right? I do it at seven o'clock, right? Before we come up here. That regardless if I'm here or not. When that time rolls around, when I see it on my watch, when I pick up my phone and I see what time it is, I don't care if I'm on vacation. Are you guys with me? I don't care if I'm on a missions trip. I don't care if I'm sick in my bed. I know that these are the proper time to pray and to worship God. Does that make sense? And so I'm, it's just built in. It's a habit. I'll be in vacation. I wake up on Sunday morning again. I'm praying. That's what you do. And it's so awesome because we see here again, Daniel had these godly routines that regardless of he was in Jerusalem or not, regardless of the temple was there or not, he was still praying. He was still worshiping God. He was still doing what he needed to do. And I'll take it one step further. It is so important, not only for our sake, but how many of you know we need to set the example for our kids? It's so important, right? I told you again, I don't know how many times I've said this. One of the worst mistakes a parent can do is to teach their kids that church is somewhere you go when there's nothing else to do that day or when there are no games that day. That's the worst thing you can do. Teach them again the importance of being in church, of reading their Bible, right? Of praying and seeking the Lord, building these habits as young people. What does the Bible say? When we train a child in the way that he should go, right? When he is old, they will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6. Again, so, so important. So real important. Again, we see the godly habits of this prayer warrior, right? Daniel, as he was praying during the evening sacrifices. Now, Daniel tells us that while, and I love it, he used the word while twice, while he was praying for his people and for the holy hill. What's the holy hill? Mount Zion, right? This is the city of Jerusalem. While he's praying for his people, right, and the land of Israel, he is interrupted. That's what it means. Right when I was in the middle, he says, he was interrupted by the man Gabriel. Now, he had already seen Gabriel back in chapter 8. If you were with us two weeks ago, again, we covered the appearance of the archangel Gabriel to Daniel, who explained to him the prophecy, right, that we found in chapter 8. Gabriel shows up here, and he came to him, notice, in swift flight. We would say he came to him like that, right? He came to him fast. He showed up fast. Now, what I love about this, I love God's timing. We just talked about Gabriel on Sunday, didn't we? He showed up to Zechariah, right, to give him the announcement of the coming of John the Baptist, right? This Sunday... Gabriel's going to show up to Mary to announce to her about our Lord Jesus, right? And here we find Gabriel, once again, the messenger of God, showing up to announce to Daniel again the future of Israel. What is going to happen to the people of Israel and the promised land? In case you're wondering, Daniel refers to him as the man because I believe he showed up in the appearance or form of a man, okay? Or form of a man. Verse 22, he, Gabriel, made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas, if someone has a pen underlined at the beginning, I love that. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out. And I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Gabriel announces to Daniel why he's come. Daniel, I have come to you to give you insight and understanding 
about what's been in your heart, about what you have been wondering about. Again, I'll, what's he been wondering about? I'll say it again. His people and the land, okay? That's what he's been wondering about. And so Gabriel tells him, at the beginning of your prayer, you guys get that? Verse 23, when you started praying, I was dispatched to bring you an answer. That's what Gabriel says. Now, I love that. Talk about a quick response to prayer, right? The moment, think about it, what he's saying. Gabriel says, Daniel, the moment you began to pray, at the beginning, when you just started, I was dispatched to bring you the answer. I was sent to provide you the answer. Now, what I love about this, again, oftentimes people think that when you pray, you got to pray these hour-long, you know, prayers. You know, you don't find hour-long prayers in the Bible. You guys know that? If you go back, and you can do this later if you want for fun. If you go back and read verses 1 through 19, Daniel's prayer, you know it will take you less than three minutes, okay? It was not this big, giant, you know, prayer. Three minutes long. But Gabriel says, at the start of your three-minute prayer, I was already on my way. And I love the picture. Because you imagine Daniel on his face, right? Possibly on his knees praying. He opens his eyes and all of a sudden Gabriel's already there, right? Gabriel is already there. God had already sent him. Now, again, the Lord speaks to this. The Bible says in Isaiah 65, 24, this is God speaking, I will answer them before they even call to me. Does God know our heart? Yes, while they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. We serve a good God, okay? I love that. Again, that is so beautiful. He knows what we're going to pray. He just wants us to do it, right? He just wants us to do it. Expend the effort. Do it. God says, I'm waiting. I'm ready. I just want to see you do it, right? I just want to see you expend the effort. Now, what I love about this, again, just quickly, notice Gabriel tells Daniel, I've come to tell to you because you are greatly loved. You guys see that? Daniel wants you to know how much God loves you. That's what he's telling him. God loves you so much that he is answering your prayer. He is sending you again the answers that you are looking for. Now we can read this and we might feel a little bit jealous, but how many of you know that God loves us just as much as he loved Daniel? Okay? And so if he answered Daniel's prayer, He'll do the same for us. We just got to pray, okay? We just got to pray. Let's move on. Number two, the prophecy. Here comes the prophecy of the 70 weeks, okay? I hope you're taking notes. Here's where the, the notes come. Verse 24, Gabriel speaking. 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city, okay? Gabriel declares, I'm telling you the future, the future that pertains to Israel. God has decreed in his program for Israel, for the Jews and for their land, 70 weeks, okay? 70 weeks. Now, let me show you something. The word weeks in the Hebrew is the word shabuah, okay? I love that, shabuah. It refers to a unit of measure. That's what it means, okay? It refers to a unit of measure. Get the idea of weeks like we think of weeks because that's not what it means. It refers to a unit of measure. Now get this. Today, we group things in dozens, don't we? Dozen donuts, right? Dozen eggs, so on and so forth. But to the Jews, the Jews were accustomed to grouping things in heptaps, groups of seven. I'll give you some examples. From the Bible, right? There are seven days in one week. It's a group of seven. Every seventh day was a Sabbath day. Every seventh year was a Sabbath year. Every, after the Sabbath years, after seven of them, they celebrated the year of Jubilee. And so everything was about groups or sets of seven. Which means that the 70 weeks literally refers to 70 sets of seven. Does that make sense? I wanted to show it to you so you have that understanding. Get the idea of weeks like we think of them, seven days, because that's not what it means. It specifically refers to 70 sets 
of seven, okay? Now, I want to remind you, and if you were with us last week, you're going to remember that. You're going to remember this. Right now, the Jews, as Daniel was in Babylon, were in Babylon for how many years? You guys remember? Seventy years. Why were they in Babylon for 70 years? Because for the previous 490 years, they had been disobedient to the law of God. God commanded in Leviticus uh, chapter 25, I believe, God commanded that the Jews were to plant and to till and to plow, right? Prune their vineyards for six years, and on the seventh year, they were to let the land rest. But in their selfishness and their greediness and their desire not to have to depend on God during that seventh year, right? They never observed the Sabbath year. For 490 years, they rebelled against God. They disobeyed God. And so what did God do? God says, you owe me 70 years, right? 490 divided by 7 is 70 years. My land, the promised land, should have rested for 70 years. And so God said, you know what? You disobeyed me. I'm kicking you out of the promised land, right? And the land will rest for 70 years, where, where they would be in captive, right, in Babylon. Now, that's very, very important. But guess what? Just as, just as they were currently, again, dealing with 70 years because of their violation of, again, Leviticus chapter 25, them not obeying the Sabbath law, so also... God had determined, look back at your verse, 70 weeks, okay? 70 sets of seven, okay? 70 sets of seven, the same period of time for the people and the land of Israel. They had disobeyed for 490 years, which was 70 sets of seven. And the future of Israel would also correspond to the next 490 years. And during the next 490 years, follow me, God will accomplish his purposes for the Jews, okay? God will accomplish his purposes for the Jews. Keep reading because we're going to read about six things that God will make sure comes to pass by the end of the 490 years or 70 sets of seven. First thing God will accomplish is will, he will finish the transgression, okay? Finish the transgression. Now, the word finish means to bring something to an end. Any study of the Jewish people knows that their whole history has been a history of sin and disobedience to God's word. Again, that's all we've seen over and over and over again. But one day, God's going to bring their transgression to an end. Even today, the Jews reject Christ as their Savior, right? But is God done with the Jews? No. Has God given up on the Jews? No. God still has a plan for the Jews. The Apostle Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 11. One day, he will finish the transgression. He will bring them to faith in the true Messiah. They will one day come to know Jesus as their Messiah. And their rejection and rebellion will come to an end. And that's what that speaks of. But keep reading. Second thing. To put an end to sin. Put an end to sin. Now again, once they come to faith in Christ as their Messiah... They will turn to a life of obedience. Their faith in Christ, dying for them on the cross, deals with their sin, right? Judges their sin. And once they understand that their sins are judged, they will then live lives of obedience unto the Messiah, unto Jesus Christ. Number three, and to atone for iniquity, okay? Atone for iniquity. Once they understand that Christ is their Messiah, they will understand that there is no longer a need to offer sacrifices. Why? Because Jesus is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. 
so that once they finally put their faith in Christ as their Messiah, their sins will be atoned for, okay? Their sins will be dealt with, basically satisfied. Their sins will be satisfied. Now, those first three things all have to do with the Jews coming to faith in the Messiah so that their sins are forgiven. The next three things have to do with what will be accomplished for the Jews when Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom on earth. Again, this is, the, this is part of 2 Samuel chapter 7. Look at number four. To bring in everlasting righteousness. When Jesus establishes his kingdom on earth, right, sin will have been done away with so that it will be an age of righteousness. That's what the millennial kingdom will be where Christ rules on earth, right? over all his creation, all, all believers. Number five, to seal both vision and profit. Once the Lord's kingdom is, is established, it will be the fulfillment of all the promises that the prophets declared through their dreams and their visions in the Old Testament, right? That will be the fulfillment of everything that had been prophesied. And number six, to anoint a most holy place. Now, according to the prophet Ezekiel, after the Lord establishes his kingdom on earth, right, the millennial kingdom for a thousand years, God will anoint the most holy place in the millennial temple. And Ezekiel prophesied about this in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. The point of all this was to make clear to Daniel that one day the people of God would return to God. They would again return from their, turn from their disobedience and turn to obedience as they live for God in everlasting righteousness. But the other thing, the other answer is so that Daniel would understand that everything the prophets declared about the future would still one day come to pass when the Messiah comes and establishes kingdom on earth. And so again, I went through that quick, but hopefully you got that. God has made clear that everything that was prophesied will happen. He's not done with the Jews. They will one day come back to him and the Messiah would come and establish his kingdom on earth. The million dollar question is when, okay? The million dollar question is when, which is what we cover last. Number three. If you're taking notes, the division of the weeks, okay? The division of the weeks, verse 25. Know therefore, and understand, again, still Gabriel speaking, that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled place time. Again, I need to remind you that Daniel and the Jews were currently in captivity for 70 years because of their disobedience over the past 490 years. And so the angel Gabriel clarifies when this next 70 sets of seven, 490 years for the people of Israel would begin. Now I'm going to show you verse 25 in the New Living Translation because it's just a little easier again. I want everyone to make sure you understand this before we leave. So I'm going to read it again, but I'm going to show you this in the New Living. Most of us use the ESV or the New King James Version, but this is, I think, the simplest, just for for sake. Verse 25, again, Gabriel talking. He says, now listen and understand. He's talking to Daniel. 70 sets of seven, there you go, plus 62 sets of seven, will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses despite the perilous times. Gabriel is giving us a timeline. This is very important, okay? He's given us a timeline. He's telling us, That from the time a command is given to rebuild Jerusalem. Remember at this time Jerusalem had been destroyed. The temple had been destroyed and they're in captivity. 
Gabriel says, the clock will start. The 490 years will begin when the command is given for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. That's very, very important because that's when, again, those 70 sets of seven, the 490 years would begin. Now notice what he said. He said, seven sets of seven. What's seven times seven, anyone? 49, okay. Plus, get your little calculator out or take your shoes off, whatever's easier, right? 62 sets of seven. What's 62 times seven? 434. Oh, I love this, okay? Are going to take place. This amount of time, this many years, is going to take place from the time that a command is given to go and rebuild Jerusalem until what? Until a ruler, the anointed one. Who's the anointed one? Jesus. I love this. God made it crystal clear. God made it really easy. Think about this. It's pretty heavy. God through Gabriel tells Daniel, between the time that there is a command given to rebuild Jerusalem until the time that the anointed one comes, there is going to be, I'll say it again, 49 plus 434, okay? The 490 years begins when the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem and seven sets of seven, 49 years, plus 62 sets of seven, 434 years, will pass until the anointed one comes. You guys with me? 49 plus 434 equals 483 years. Now, I love that because God told them specifically when Jesus was coming. Wow. Wow. The Jews have the Old Testament, don't they? Wow. According to Nehemiah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, Artaxerxes, you guys remember the book of Nehemiah, issued the decree allowing for the Jews to return back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. You guys remember that story? This took place on March 5th, 444 B.C., Based upon a Jewish calendar, a Jewish calendar has, doesn't have 365 like we do. Their calendar is 360 days. Based upon the Jewish 360-day calendar, 49 years later would be 393 B.C. When the city was completely restored, Malachi was dead, and the Old Testament period came to an end. Okay? You might be asking, what's the 49 years signify? Well, remember... Daniel's part of the Old Testament, isn't he? 49 years symbolizes how long more it would be until the Old Testament comes to a close. Now, if you were with us on Sunday, I shared with you that between the Old and the New Testament, there were roughly, how many? 400 years of silence. We just covered this on Sunday, okay? Very, very important. 430 years, 34 years later, 49 plus, right? What is it? 434. Takes us to March 30th, 33 AD, which is the day that Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, declaring that the Messiah had come. Do we know that story? Okay. It came to pass with exact precision. Okay. Get this. It came to pass to the day. Can you imagine that? Why do skeptics hate the book of Daniel, right? Why do atheists say that there's no way this book could be real? That it had to be written centuries after all this took place? Because they can't explain that. But this is incredible. Because any Jew that would have read the Old Testament, any Jew that would have read the prophecies of Daniel would have known when the Messiah was coming, right? Isn't it interesting that the Magi, you guys remember the Magi? Knew the Messiah was coming? You guys know where the Magi came from? Babylon. Where's Daniel? Babylon, okay? The Jews missed it. They had the word of God before them, but they missed it. Today, they have the word of God before them, but they missed it. 
Now, what's so incredible about this, and again, what I love, I love Palm Sunday. I love to teach this message. You guys have heard it before. But after Jesus enters on the donkey, right? Zechariah 9.9, he comes riding on a mule. In fulfillment of that prophecy, the Bible says, and if you were with us in, in Israel, we stopped at this spot when Jesus overlooked the city. You guys might remember where the temple would have stood. And Luke records that Jesus said this. Luke 19, 41 to 42. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. Jesus cries, saying, if you had known, even you, who's he talking to? His people, the Jews. Especially in this your day. This was the day. This was the day. If you would have known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Jesus was talking about this. They should have known they had the word of God, but they failed to learn and to study the word of God. And it came to pass just as Daniel foreseen it, right? Just as Gabriel announced to Daniel. Verse 26. And after... The 62 weeks. Now, if you have a pen, underline the word after. That's very important. After the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. Gabriel declares that after the 62 weeks are up, when this time has passed, right? An anointed one. Who's the anointed one? Jesus shall be cut off. What does that mean? Killed, crucified, referring to his death and crucifixion, and shall have nothing. Now, from the Jewish standpoint, Jesus died for nothing, didn't he? From the Jewish standpoint that reject him, he died failing to establish the kingdom that he came to establish. They didn't understand. In their mind, again, he died for nothing. They didn't understand that he died for them. In their mind, he died for nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come, this is not Jesus, this is the one who is to come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood. Now, as we look back at history, 40 years after Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected, What happened? The Romans came in under the leadership of Titus, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, right? Slaughtered thousands upon tens of thousands of Jews and destroyed the temple. Destroyed the sanctuary. All this happened again in the year 70 AD. When you go to Jerusalem today, do you see a temple? No, all you see is the temple mount. The foundation, that's all that's left. And you see the Wailing Wall, right? The last remaining section of the previous temple. That's all you see. Notice, this happened in 70 AD, right? And who did it? It says here, the people of the prince who is to come. Now again, this is not talking about the prince of peace, right? This is talking about the prince who is to come, His people are going to destroy the city. Now, this is not talking about Jesus and his people, the Jews, destroying the city. They wouldn't have done that, right? This is talking about who? The Antichrist. And his people will destroy the city, right? And the sanctuary. Now, we know from history that the city and the sanctuary were destroyed by the Romans. We know that. It isn't an interesting If you were with us back in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, we read that the Antichrist will one day come out of the revived, what? Roman Empire, okay? He will reestablish the revived and, and revive, again, the Roman Empire that was never defeated from the outside. They imploded from the inside. Keep reading. And to the end, there shall be war. Desolations are decree. Daniel is told, unfortunately, that until the very end, Israel is going to be involved in war. And wow, has that come to pass, right? 
There's punishment for not believing in the Messiah. There's consequences for rejecting the Son of God. And they will continue to face war up until the very end. It says desolations, which means devastation, misery is decreed again until they stop rejecting the Messiah and finally come to faith in Jesus. Last verse, verse 27. And he, who's the he? We just talked about the prince, didn't he? He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. Now, if you were with us in Revelation, again, we covered this in a lot of detail. You might remember that when the Antichrist comes, according to Revelation chapter 6, he will come like a rider on a white horse. You guys remember that? He will come with a bow but no arrows because he's going to become world ruler, not through force, not through violence, but he will come as a man of peace, right? He will come as a man of peace. We talked about this. We find that in Revelation 6, 2. As he comes as the head of the revived Roman Empire, he will establish a peace treaty with Israel for how long? For one week. How long is one week? Seven years, okay? Very, very important. Now, I want to point something out because you, you cannot miss this. Again, this is vital to our message tonight. Seven sets of seven equals 49 years. Plus 62 sets of seven is 434 years. We covered that already. And then there is one more set of seven, right? Seven more years, which brings the complete uh, saga, we would say, of the people of Israel to a close. Does that make sense? 490 years. Now, we just covered, in verse 25, we covered the 483 years, right? The 49 plus the 434. And then in verse 26, I asked you to underline the word after, right? That's interesting. Gabriel tells Daniel that from the time Artaxerxes sends Nehemiah to build, rebuild Jerusalem to the time of Jesus comes, declares himself in the triumphal entry, 483 years are going to pass, okay? There's seven remaining years. But then in verse 26, we're told after Jesus makes his triumphal entry, he's going to be killed. In other words, what happened with Jesus in his death, burial, resurrection, with ha what happened to the temple being destroyed is after the 483 years, but before the last seven years. Does that make sense? In other words, it is separate from the plan God has for Israel. What happens, again, between the 483 and last seven years is separated. It is not a part of God's plan for Israel, which tells us two interesting things. Number one, that the 490 years are not consecutive, okay? Because the last seven years doesn't take place until the Antichrist comes, right? We would say God's plan for Israel, we would say, is on break, is on a hiatus. We understand what that means, right? The clock stopped when Jesus entered on the donkey, declaring himself as the Messiah, and the clock will start again, the last seven years will start again when the Antichrist makes his peace treaty with Israel. The question you should be asking is why is there a break? Why is there an interval, right, in the plan God has for Israel? And the answer to the question is so simple, but it's so beautiful. I want you to think about what happens during the time of Christ, right? The time Jesus died, was buried, resurrected. 
all the way until the Antichrist comes. What is happening during that time? The church is in existence. Isn't that right? The church is in existence. The church was birthed, right? When Christ resurrected, and then the day of Pentecost. And the church is taken from the earth when the rapture happens. Right after the rapture happens, the Antichrist makes his appearance and establishes his peace treaty with Israel. Now the question, and I kind of love this, how come God didn't reveal that to Daniel? How come God didn't reveal to Daniel about the church and, and Pentecost and the rapture? Because that has nothing, to, what Daniel would receive has nothing to do with us. This is God's plan for the Jews. Does that make sense? I want to make that clear again. Interesting, Jeremiah in Jeremiah 30 verse 7 referred to the last seven years of Jewish history as the time of Jacob's trouble. Have you guys heard that before? The time of Jacob's trouble. We know the last seven years as the seven-year tribulation, right? We covered that in book of Revelation from Revelation 6 all the way to Revelation chapter 19. Let's finish this off. And for half of the week, he, the Antichrist, shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Now, as we studied Revelation, we read that after the Antichrist makes peace for seven years, the Jews accept the peace. Why? Because if there's one thing the Jews have wanted for thousands of years is what? Peace in the Middle East, right? And they want it today. Why do the Jews want it so bad? Because the Jews want to be able to obey the law of Moses, but they cannot offer sacrifices because right now there is no temple. And so the Jews want peace so they can rebuild their temple and begin offering sacrifices, right, in obedience to the command or the law of Moses. Interesting, do you guys know, Jewish rabbis today believe that the Messiah will be the one who brings peace to Israel. Which is why when the Antichrist is able to do that, they're going to initially embrace the Antichrist as the Messiah. Again, it's so sad. But what happens, again, we read here, which is what we read in Revelation, three and a half years into the last seven years, what happens? The Antichrist breaks his covenant with Israel, right? Begins persecuting the Jewish people and desecrates the temple. You guys might remember, according to Revelation chapter 13, the false prophet will create for the Antichrist a false idol, which is then set up in the temple, which the Antichrist will command the world to worship. Anyone who does not worship the idol and receive the mark of the beast is what? Beheaded. Okay, we read about all this again uh, months ago in Revelation chapter 13. Now, when the Antichrist desecrates the temple, it will fulfill what Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24, 15. Notice what Jesus said. It all comes together. So when you, speaking of the Jews, see the abomination of desolation, same words, spoken by the prophet who? Daniel. Standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Jesus was telling the Jews, when you see the Antichrist desecrate the temple, standing in the temple, proclaiming himself as God, then you'll understand, okay? Then you'll understand. Again, this was all in fulfillment of what Daniel was given. Again, to wrap it all up, after the seven years are up, right, the Lord Jesus comes, he returns in his second coming, destroys the Antichrist in the battle of Armageddon, the Antichrist is then thrown into the lake of fire, and Jesus will then establish his kingdom on earth for how long? For a thousand years, fulfilling all of the prophecies 
promised in the Old Testament. Again, I hope you got it tonight. Again, I know it's kind of heavy duty, but I hope you got it. We pick it up next week, chapter 10, as God reveals more about the future of Israel to Daniel. Let's pray. Let's pray tonight. Again, Father, we we thank you tonight, as always, Lord God, for your word. Heavy-duty stuff, Lord God, but I pray that we would be so blown away at just how awesome you are, how accurate your word is, that we would come to, again, be reassured that when you say you're going to do something, you do it. You say you're coming back, you're coming back. You say that if we're not right with you, when your son comes, we'll be left behind. Lord, all of these things, all of this knowledge has been given us to us, this insight so that we would have understanding, Lord God, that you have a plan, that you know what you're doing, and that in your timing, you're going to bring all this to pass. Give us wisdom, Lord God. Help us to respond accordingly, and most of all, help us to be prepared. Lord, we love you. We thank you as always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand, guys. Let's stand.